I'd like to begin by sort of saying in what capacity I worked on the healthcare.gov website as, by, by way of introduction. Uh, many people know from news reports and so on that several people who helped out with the healthcare.gov website uh, work at Google. And I work at Google, but this was not a Google project at all. Uh, Google supported us only by letting us take unpaid personal leave to do this with our own time. So uh, it wasn't officially a Google project, and uh, nothing that I'm saying here is as a representative of, of Google. Um, I'm, I'm only talking about my personal work. So I'd like to tell you stories of a couple of incidents that took place during the month of February when I was uh, in the Washington, D.C. area working on the healthcare.gov website. And uh, I'll move on at the end to sort of wrap up and try to say something about what I think all of that means. Um, President Obama has managed to do something that several others before him have tried to do and failed, and that is that he's achieved a first step toward improving the American healthcare system and making uh, healthcare available to more people. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. It's certainly not a perfect law that he's gotten passed, but it's a step. So um, one thing about this law is that its implementation depends crucially on this website, the healthcare.gov website. So um, that's a very important point. In mid-October of 2013, after the uh, government shutdown ended, the failure of the launch of healthcare.gov was the top story on the news in the United States and um, got a lot of attention, and, and rightly so. It really meant that this crucial website was not usable by the people who needed it the most. By early November, a few people had gone to the D.C. area to try to rescue the website or determine whether it could be rescued. One of them is a colleague of mine named Mikey Dickerson, who um, I really felt like if anybody could help, he would be able to do it. Uh, he's an amazing guy. And at that time, I was just proud to know someone who had gone to help. I had no thought of going myself. So uh, it was later in about January, early January sometime, when uh, Mikey and another colleague from Google who had gone later than Mikey approached me and said, hey, you know, you, maybe you should go and help. Can you do it? And um, they described to me the situation with the site at that time. The, uh, the technical side of the situation was that they had managed to get the site to the point where it could serve traffic with constant care and feeding. Uh, it was not reliable, very unstable many, many single points of failure, definitely not the way you would ever want to build a production system. And we'll see a few details of, of uh, architectural problems with the system in the, in the coming slides. Um, there were also serious capacity challenges. We knew that as the deadline for open enrollment for 2014 approached in March, traffic would increase. And we also knew that at the beginning of 2014, the site could not serve that amount of traffic. When I got to the D.C. area, this is the room that I went into. This is called the Exchange Operations Center, or the War Room. Um, and to give you an idea of sort of what the culture is like and what the different forces are tugging on the various interests there, there are representatives in this room, in this very picture, from the White House, from the sort of ad hoc tech surge, which is what we called ourselves, people like me doing, doing what I'm doing. There's one other one in that picture. Um, there are people from the Department of Health and Human Services, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Systems. There are people from multiple companies, QSSI, Optum, Oracle, MarkLogic, Verizon, URS, uh, what else? At least two more um, are in this picture. All of these companies are contracted to the U.S. government to provide a particular service that's a part of the website. None of those companies is contracted to make sure that the site works. <laughs> Another important point about this picture is what do these people do? One of the things, <laughs> I still wonder, <laughs> but one of the things they do actually is important. One of the things they do is monitoring because the situation, the monitoring architecture for the site is completely broken. 
it's way better than it was. When Mikey got there in October, there was no monitoring. He had to shout across the room for people to open their browsers and see if the site worked. That's the monitoring they had at that time. It's much better now. It was much better by the time I arrived. The situation when I arrived was that you could see some things about were requests arriving, were we serving errors, how much CPU were we using. These things you could see. But, uh, but details, when you wanted to dig into the details, every company with its own project, MarkLogic, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera, Verizon owns the firewall or runs the firewall. Um, the list goes on and on. Each one of these companies has their private consoles. They're not private like they're trying to keep them secret from me, but they're private in the sense that they don't have any API that makes the monitoring data available to an, a place where I can aggregate it and actually build a console that everyone in the room can see. So you run around the room looking at people's laptops, shoulder surfing to see like what's broken and what's not. Or you ask them questions and you hope you get the right answer. These humans, a lot of what they do is that monitoring. When, when there's an incident, you ask them for help because they're the ones with the, with the consoles. So a simplified block diagram of the production architecture. Um, I'll go through each piece really quickly because it gives you some context for the incidents that I'll tell you about. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the users. I know at this conference, we think of the cloud as the production serving architecture, but in this picture, the cloud is the rest of the world and the rectangular boxes are, are uh, the production architecture. So fairly standard front-end infrastructure that requests come in to a security gateway. And uh, then the, the initial requests when you go to access the site for the first time are shunted through load balancing to an accounts and authentication system where you can either create an account or log in. So once you've logged in and you have your authentication token, you can go through the security gateway through another bunch of load balancing into the core application that implements the logic of the part of the law that the website provides. So uh, backends to the core application are things like the data services hub, which is another complete system that I'm not showing any details of, behind which, uh, the, well, the hub aggregates data from a bunch of government agencies like the Social Security Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, the Veterans Administration. These are for determining what kinds of benefits you're eligible for, what kinds of subsidies you're eligible for, that sort of thing. So what, what policies will the application display to you and what, what prices will it display to you? Also, there's a private company called Experian that's used for what, what, what we call identity proofing, basically. Are you actually entitled to act as the person uh, or the head of household or whatever to buy this insurance? Uh, Experian makes figures into that determination somehow. Of course, there's a database. It's an XML database. The code stores the state of your application for an insurance policy, the state of your uh, traversal of the process through the website in this database, along with information about what insurance policies you've been shown and this sort of thing. There's a cache also, a distributed uh, cache that sometimes works to protect the XML database um, from uh, overload. It's basically a capacity cache. The first story I want to tell you about is about an incident that took place early in February when uh, Traffic was ramping up like it normally does in the late morning. It was uh, between 10.30 and 11 a.m. And what we saw all of a sudden was the, uh, the core application began serving 100% errors. And the latency of all the requests served by the core application dropped to nearly zero. Uh, typical latency is hundreds of milliseconds or even a second, depending on the traffic level. Uh, the other thing we saw was that the traffic to the accounts and authentication subsystem went up by a factor of two or three. Um, so, what's the problem? We don't know, but we know that correlated with the high error rate is low latency in the application. So, we naturally assume that maybe the database is involved somehow because the database is the main source of request serving latency. So, uh, if the latency is low, maybe the database isn't doing anything. We go to the, the human in the picture. Remember, there was a picture with a lot of humans with laptops open. One of those humans has a console that no one else has for the database. And you go and you ask this human, is the database getting requests from the application? And the human says, no. <laughs> he has no idea 
whether the database is getting requests from the application. It turns out no was not the right answer. Or maybe he misunderstood the question. So no was not the right answer. We dug through logs. We found out that the user for which, using which, or the role that the application uses to authenticate to the database was getting permission denied errors for every request. So every request was coming back from the database with an error that was permission denied. You're not allowed to do anything to the database. So, uh, oh, I skipped a step telling you about this. This is important too, so I, I have to go back to it. Um, when the outage began, I, we yelled out to the room and to the conference bridge. There's a, there's a Polycom conference phone that's open to other locations where there are ops people and developers that are responsible for various parts of the site, not in that room. And we asked, did anybody do anything at 10.48 a.m.? Silence. <laughs> Somebody did something, though. We dug, we found out that uh, looking in the logs, the permissions of the user that the core application uses had changed at 1048, and this caused the outage. They changed because someone ran a command. Someone who thought he was adding additional permissions to this user in preparation for a new rollout of a, a new version of the software uh, had instead replaced the permissions. So took away all the permissions that the current software needed to work on the database, put in a few more that didn't do anything. So imagine you're that guy. It was a guy. You type a command, you hit return. When I imagine myself in those shoes, I, I, think of, I think I would do maybe one of three things. One is I hit return and I don't even realize that maybe I did something, so I just walk away and I go get some coffee. And I, I don't even hear anyone ask, did anybody do anything because I'm away from my machine now. I, you know, I go and get a hamburger or something. So another possibility is I realize Holy crap, I just turned the website off. Yes, it was me. I say it out loud and I, I tell everybody, I need help. Please help me get the website back. I just did something that I didn't mean to do and we need to undo it as quickly as possible. Third possibility. Oh shit, it was me. <laughs> Maybe no one will notice. It turns out the third possibility is the winning strategy in this ecosystem. You do number three because if somebody notices, you'll probably get fired. He did get fired that day. So uh, when I make the same kind of mistake at Google, I can't anymore because I'm not an SRE, but I used to be an SRE and I made that kind of mistake. I did number two because I knew I was in a supportive environment where people would help and I wouldn't get fired. I would learn how to avoid the mistake in the future. And of course, if I made that kind of mistake every day, maybe it was a problem. But I got the support that I needed. Major cultural difference between DC government contracting IT and sort of effective real world IT that I hope all of you have in your work situations as well. So story number two. Oh, we, we added the permissions back to the user and the site came back up. So end of story. Uh, story number two, another incident. Uh, I, this block diagram doesn't look that crazy, but you start to see the insanity of the production architecture when you peel back just one or two layers of, of the onion. Um, so all of these things in the, in, in the implementation of the site need to store files. Somebody read somewhere that there are these boxes that are really good at storing files. This is, a, this is a NetApp filer of some kind. It may or may not be exactly the model that is at the healthcare.gov website, but it's something like this. And it's really good at storing files. So you buy one of these and you hook it up to the website because you need to store some files. <laughs> and uh, so there's your filer and you've hooked it up to store some files, but you really, you have more files that you need to store, so let's store some more files. Uh, actually, there are even more files. So, and, and still more files. By the time I got there in February, there were 19 NetApp filers, all of which were single points of failure for the entire site. 
That's not good. <laughs> so, late one afternoon, near the end of February, I and a bunch of colleagues were about to go to dinner. It was going to be a nice dinner. It ended up postponed. I was there late that night, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the site started serving errors, and at first it looked like it might be with the accounts and authentication subsystem. Um, the monitoring for that subsystem is especially poor, so it always looks suspect when things begin to go south. But very quickly, we saw that other, other systems unrelated to it had problems too. The hub had problems, the core application had problems, so something big was going on. I suspected a network problem or a firewall problem, um, you know, some kind of configuration change or somebody had stepped on an ethernet cable or something like that. Um, and so, of course, we started digging into what the problem was and I couldn't log into any of the machines. I had an account on a very tiny number of machines, but mostly it was just like pulling strings and remote controlling people. Uh, somebody notices that one of the VMs in the database has mounted Filer 19 read-only, and it needs to write to Filer 19 because that's the database. So those files are part of the database. So we start digging, and it turns out that all of the hosts that mount Filer 19 have mounted it read-only. Uh, so the, the prophecy has come true. It's a single point of failure for the site. And we need to figure out like, what happened and how do we get the website back. We're not going to be able to fix the architecture, but at least we can maybe get Filer 19 back and turn the website back on. So uh, it turns out that it happened because of people disagree. You could call it a bug or you could call it a configuration error in the setup of the NetApp Filer. So it turns out that this is supposed to be a robust system. It, is robust to failures of single drives, but actually what happened was a single drive failure called a back, caused a backup in the write cache. The write cache filled up, write requests were denied for 30 seconds, Linux remounts a file system uh, read-only after it's denied write requests for 30 seconds. So that's what happened. Um, and to fix it, we had to manually restart all of the 171 hosts because there is no automated system for executing commands on all the hosts. Somebody had to log in to 171 hosts and, and, and get this file system remounted, read-write. So um, then, once you have the hosts back, you have to do very carefully choreographed restarts of the app, the cache server, and the database, because if you restart them in, in any order, they don't work. No one knows why this is, but they don't. So, the final aspect of this story is that, you know, I mentioned the monitoring for the accounts and authentication subsystem is, is a little bit worse than average, and the average is low for this site. So, we got ready to serve traffic, and I did my little thing where I went around the room. Is your thing ready for traffic? We're going to turn it on. People are going to try to get health insurance. So, I went to the accounts and authentication subsystem folks, and I said, hey, you know, we're about to turn the site on, are you ready? Can you handle the traffic? They said yes. That was 75% right. Uh, they served a 25% error rate because one of their four backends was down. And um, so eventually they, I mean, it was, again, a manual reconfiguration of the load balancer moved all the traffic off of that bad backend so that the site could serve at 100%. Uh, I'm doing badly on time, so I'm going to run through this stuff. What does it mean? What can we learn from this and, and other, other stuff? The, uh, the incentive structure under which the people work in that world is really different from anything that I've worked with before, and I hope it's different from what you work with. Like I said earlier, no one's job was to provide a working website. Everyone's job was to provide their little part and I guess somebody thought that all those parts would add up magically to a working website. So, I'll tell you a story. I visited one of the contractors one day and, uh, and introduced myself to a lot of the developers and the project managers and so on, uh, just to sort of find out like, 
how people worked and who I needed to talk to if I had various kinds of problems and this sort of thing, just getting, getting acquainted. And it's important to realize these are good people. They're, some of them are competent engineers, some of them are really bad engineers, some of them aren't engineers at all, but they're just trying to do the best they can in the situation they find themselves in. But they're in a bad situation. They're like really stinky anaerobic bacteria in, a, you know, in an ecosystem that you and I probably can't imagine living in, except that I've been there now. So the ecosystem is really different. The incentives are really different. What succeeds in that environment is really different from anything that I've been familiar with before directly. I've heard about this, this stuff, but now I've experienced it. So uh, I went to talk to this contractor, and one of, the, one of the people introduced herself to me and said, I'm in charge of security for the application. And I thought, oh, interesting. That, let me find out more about what you do. First question I asked her, what are the main threats that you worry about? She said, threats? I don't worry about threats. I do risk management. So I was confused by that answer. So I asked for more information. And it turns out that what risk management means in that context is there are some checkboxes in a contract. The software has to be audited to determine that all of these checkboxes can be checked off. And once they're all checked off, her job is done. So I guess there are some meetings, and they look at the function names, and if one of them says, like, DOS protection, they can check that box off. And another, I'm, I'm imagining this, but this is what it sounded like. There are these checkboxes, and we check them off, and we don't think about the threats. And how, anyway. So there is this sort of, uh, like I said, many of these people are or could be good engineers, but there's a kind of soul-crushing uh, bad incentive to uh, do as little as possible. Inaction is rewarded because if you make a mistake like that poor guy who caused the first incident I described, you probably get fired. So don't do anything you don't have to do. Do only what you have to do. Don't take initiative because you'll be punished if it doesn't work right. I was in a privileged position because I could walk in and make it my job to make the website work I could make it my job to take the blame for whatever I wanted to do. And other people probably knew before I got there that that was what we should do, but no one could stick their neck out and say, hey, you know, I'm going to take the fall for this if it goes badly because I really believe in it. Um, I was in the nice position of being able to do that because if I got fired, I got to go home to my, <laughs> my wonderful job at Google. So, uh, so everybody was happy to have people like us there who could sort of be the blame deflection uh, points for them. The website was designed with production as an afterthought. I don't really know how this happened. But, uh, but I, it, it seems as if somebody decided that if the logic in the code is correct, all the rest is just going to happen. So like, what could possibly go wrong with a database? Oracle's great. You go and buy Oracle at the Oracle store. And you put it in your website, and it works. <laughs> and maybe you even get some support people to come and help you put it in your website. So uh, the production architecture was really, um, there was no thought about capacity. Like I said, when Mikey got there in October, there was no monitoring to speak of. You can't have production without monitoring. So uh, I don't know why that happened. Everybody's concerned with their job, and whatever's outside their job is not their problem. And they don't look to get information about what's outside their job. This is my thing. I check off the security boxes, and I'm done. Or I check off the database boxes, and I'm done. So there are, like I said, people who care about making the whole website work, but it's not actually their job. And if they do it, they might get punished. So there is this sort of enforced silo situation among all of the companies that are involved in, in running the site. The most effective services that I've seen run have a small, highly empowered, highly competent team of engineers responsible for running them. That's how I would describe web search at Google, and that's not how I would describe healthcare.gov. So we were sort of that 
team as an afterthought. Um, it, was, it was nice that we managed to get into that position and managed to be somewhat effective. We, like I said, we were not able to fix the architecture of the, of the servers, but uh, we were able to actually get the site up and keep it up um, while we were there. So uh, I don't actually know whether the site is down now. The traffic to the site is much lower than it was because the open enrollment period for 2014 ended on March 31st. And so basically the site is in a dormant period between March 31st and the opening of 2015 open enrollment in October. So the site needs to really work again by October. In the intervening period, there is traffic hitting the site. You can do things with it, but uh, it's not a high activity time for the site and there may be extended maintenance periods. And the real impact of that is much lower than it would be during a real enrollment period. So um, the happiest news that I can give you about this entire experience is that in the executive branch, at, at very high levels, there are people who care about learning from this problem and, and who want to help the next major IT implementation of a government service succeed and are, are working very, very hard to make sure that happens. So um, there's a ton of work to be done. Like I described, you have to change a whole ecosystem to make this happen, but people are working on it some people do understand, some people in the government do understand uh, what kind of change is needed to, to bring this about. And, and they need people like us to keep informing them about like, what the good life really looks like because it's not something most of them have ever seen before. Um, that's what I've got. Thank you.